In chapter 8, we're going to talk about breaking out on multiple time frames. The same thing that we talked about on the ABCD type patterns on the daily chart and the intraday charts and how they line up on multiple time frames, three month charts, six month charts, you name it. We're going to talk about the gap play, how to actually buy something the day before, anticipating that gap up, the follow through momentum, the follow through pump, the follow through emotional. I've got to be in type of action that you can actually sell to the next morning. The gearing and perking, the same ABCD type patterns that we went over on the NASDAQs work here. We're going to cover that and you'll see exactly how they work and how much better they work. We're going to go over pumpers. You need to understand if you're going to trade OTCs, who's hot, what's going on, who's cold, and how to monitor that. The pumpers are always changing, who's hot and cold are always changing, but the ability to monitor and understanding how to monitor is not. So you can always use the data that you can monitor and be able to make a decision from there. OTC shorts, you need to know what stocks are worth shorting, where the volume is, what types of newsletters only have that morning action and then that's it, they fizzle the rest of the day. In other words, which ones are just pretty much one and done type pumps. And last but not least, which is a much riskier play, the bounce plays. Bounce plays into panic, anticipating that rebound as it's free falling. And this is something that's not for new traders, but it's something that you should learn by watching over and over and over. And once you're ready to make that call yourself, that's when you're ready. If you have to ask, where do you think it's going to bottom? Do you think it's a good buy here? You should not be trading it. Next up is the bread and butter, the OTC textbook setups. Stuff that I love, the stuff that I started on and past couple of years, it was a big part, and now it's, it's pretty much probably about 10% of what I do. Most of what I trade is NASDAQ. However, every now and then, you're going to get that good play, and certain newsletters come off very hot runs, and you want to be able to take advantage of their next play. First up is breakout on multiple time frames, and we've gone over this before. It's when you want the breakout not only on the intraday chart, when you're looking at it during that particular day where it looks like it's about to just take off. You want to be able to match that with something on the daily chart where it's also about to break and take off. And when those two things come together, you get a much bigger breakout. Next, we'll go over the gap play, basically anticipating that it's going to gap up the next morning. Follow through momentum. It had a strong close. There's a good chance that it's going to open up higher the next day. And like I told you before, I rarely hold NASDAQs overnight. OTCs, however, I will as long as it's not too deep into a sketchy promotion. Once it gets into a promotion that's been out for a couple weeks or even a, a week or two and it's, it's ran from a dollar to four dollars and there's just a bunch of questions and uh, kind of weird PRs and stuff like that, there's a point where the risk versus the reward, the reward quite isn't there. So I'll go over the gap plays. The gearing and perking is the same stuff that we went over for NASDAQs, but it works even better on OTCs. I'll go over Pumpers 101. Basically, all you need to know about Pumpers and, and the websites that I pay attention to, and again, they come and go. It's not always going to be the same. It's not always going to be this one was the hottest and now it's the worst, and they come and go, and that's what you have to understand. You have to be able to react. OTC shorts, I'll tell you the types of shorts that I like and what I'm looking for, and lastly, the bounce plays, panic mode. What I'm interested in, I'll go over it. I'm not always interested in every single stock that drops, and I'm going to tell you exactly what to look for and what types of trades that I'm interested in, and it's mainly focused around liquidity. So let's just do a quick review of breaking out on multiple time frames and again what it looks like. And you can see, I'll show a couple different charts here, but you can see this move towards two, then it consolidates at a higher level, and then it starts to grind up and it busts that two, and you've got a breakout that pretty much doubles. Then Settles back, consolidates again, starts to hold nice support at three cents, it starts to re-break towards that four, and then boom, you've got another breakout that literally doubles. So now let's look at a longer term. This is the same thing we were just looking at. You had that first breakout, consolidate, breakout again, consolidate, breakout, and you can see it went on to 
triple right here. So this is why I like multiple time frame breakouts because if it's just a random day that it just pops up, that's great. It might trade very nicely. It might give you a couple different opportunities. But when you actually have a lot of traders watching it, a big market, now take a look at the volume here too. You're talking about 20, 40 million share days. When you have this, you have a lot of trades. You have it spread out. It's not just a handful of traders that are in the stock. It's actually thousands and thousands of different people that are buying and selling and thinking the same thing and creating the market. And that's what you want because that's what creates liquidity. So you can see here where it puts in the top here, the top here, and the top here, and then the ABCD type pattern that we're talking about. And this is all on the daily chart. So you line it up with the intraday chart, and then you go ahead and anticipate that big breakout. Next up is ABKFQ. It's a bankrupt stock, but there's a couple things to see here. Number one, you can see the morning move, and then it starts to consolidate, and it starts to hold higher lows. So you can see the ABCD type pattern that we look for. And then when it breaks this 0.06, obviously that's when you want to get long based on what we've covered so far in this DVD. So you get that nice breakout and then it continues on. and Sure, it ends up doubling from there. But let's take a look at what the daily chart looks like. So here it is. You've got this big move to 0.06. Starts to pull back, consolidate around 0.03, and starts to put in a short-term top at 0.04. Ends up breaking through that. And then intraday, as you saw right here, it breaks up consolidates, and it looks like a great buy intraday, but you couple that with the daily chart, and all of a sudden you have a multiple time frame breakout. You're breaking out on the daily chart, and you're breaking out intraday, and as you can see, right here where it breaks 0.045 was the prior top here, here, and here, and then as soon as it breaks that 0.06, it's a major breakout on the daily, and it's pretty much the sky is the limit for however long it can hold. So let's take a look at EKDKQ, and there's a couple things that I want to look at here. Number one, sure, it doesn't really look like too much intraday, but if you're familiar with the chart, if you're familiar with the stock, you remember number one, it runs, and number two, hey, this stock is set up to go. So the first thing that gets my interest is this two, these two volume bars right here. All of a sudden, it's got a half a million and then a 1.2 million share volume bar. Well, if you look at the daily chart, it's pretty nicely set up on the daily chart. It breaks out to 21, pulls back, consolidates between 20 and 21 for quite some time, which is really setting up a nice base for the next move. So if it breaks out from there, the next resistance is probably around 22 level because it's topped out here, 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 and here, and here. And then it's really blue skies until the 25, 26 level, and after that, anything's possible. So as you can see, draw the line here, and if it breaks this, you've got all this free room in between here to run. And if it breaks that, it could keep on going and going and going. So going back, what you're interested in is once it breaks out, once it breaks that prior resistance, now that prior resistance is more than likely going to become support. And that's how I play it. So if it breaks out, then it starts to pull back. That prior top is now going to be the bottom. Then it goes back up. And you start to play the washouts. You start to buy as long as the trend holds. And if you draw a line under here, you can see that it held the trend all the way. And as I said, if it breaks this, really the sky is the limit. And as you can see, it busted through that 25 level, 26 level, and it went straight up since. And once again, it's not always going to work out this perfect. But the point is, is when you can line up the intraday breakout with something where during that day you can say, all right, I'm going to risk a penny, a penny and a half, a half a penny, whatever it may be, for the potential reward if it breaks out at 22, if it breaks out at 23, it could run 2, 3, 5, 10 cents. And that's what you're going for. That's the important part here, setting your risk first reward and being able to take advantage of multiple time frame breakouts. The more time frames that you can line up that breakout on, the more powerful it's going to be. Next, I want to cover anticipating a gap play. And basically, the gap play, like I mentioned before, is you're anticipating that it's going to open higher than it closed. So it's a bullish chart breaking out of its range. It has a history of gapping. It's not something that usually runs into the close and then the next day it ends up either selling off or just kind of hanging out. 
you want it to have a history showing on the chart the candlesticks where it closed at the highs and then it gaps up and it continues going. Meaning, if it closes at 10 cents, there's a good chance that it opens at 12 cents, 13 cents, and then it goes to 15. You want it to close near the high days. You're looking for a profit within the first 5 to 10 minutes the following day. You're not looking to buy it and marry it and, you know, if it ends up pulling back at the open or if it ends up just kind of standing still, that's not the trade that you're looking to take. So you need to get up. You need to go ahead and either take your profits or take it off for even or a small scratch loss and then move on. The people that lose on gap plays are the people that are not taking the profits in the first 5 or 10 minutes. And they say, oh, well, you know, maybe this thing could go a little bit higher. I'll give it a chance. Well, guess what? Most of the time, these follow-through momentum trades will gap up, they'll run a little bit, and then they'll drop hard. So if you're not familiar with it, don't take it. And that's what I always tell people is if you're not familiar with the pumps, if you're not familiar with any of that kind of stuff, just watch and learn until you can make the decision on your own. You don't want to chase strength, but you want to wait for the opportunity. You want to wait for it to pull back. Too many people do the wrong thing. you got a stock that's closing really well. A lot of volume that's going hard into the close, and everybody wants to be in. So all of a sudden, they're like, bye, 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 right into the close. Well, guess what? Everybody that just bought into the close, anticipating a gap up, anticipating morning strength, if there isn't, they're all a seller. So now you have major competition. So typically, if there's a ton of people coming in to the close, a lot of volume, I consider that a crowded trade, and I go ahead and take some off if not all of it. But if there's more people coming in than I anticipated, and it's not just your normal trending, trading type of stock, and it's closing well, but rather it's just boom, 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 you see 100K, 100K, 80K, 100K, 500K, all kinds of shares coming in from 3.50 to 4 o'clock. I don't want to be in that trade because that's all competition for you in the morning if something doesn't go right. So again, what I look for is a stock that has a good close that's not really quote unquote front ran, but it did close and trend towards its highs, has a good daily chart, has a good intraday chart, and it's likely that the momentum will carry over. And again, I look for dips into the close. After 3 p.m., I start looking for opportunities. As long as trends hold, just like when we went over on EKDKQ, look for those washouts. Have a set risk first reward, just like you would any other time, but focus on entries, on dips. Don't buy into strength. So just to give you a couple examples of what a gap looks like, you can see here on talk, this day to this day it gapped up. This day had a strong close, gapped up, gapped up again, and gapped up again. And the same thing with WSGP. And each day it started to kind of gap up a little bit each day. But again, once these things get towards 2 bucks and they start to really overextend, same thing with this one, I start to go overnight less and less just because it's not really worth the risk first reward. And once everybody knows, once everybody gets used to it, and once everybody kind of is on the same page and starts thinking, oh yeah, I gotta overnight it because it always opens up and then I can sell right in the morning. Well, they're smart too, the people behind the programs. And when they start to see more and more volume come into the close, they're gonna take advantage of it, sell to you, and then they're gonna have a week open, shake you out, and then they'll buy it back lower. But let's take a look at a non-program type trade, meaning not really a pump, but rather a, an old NASDAQ, in this case it's, it's Kodak, has real volume, real trend, and, and isn't relying on mailers and newsletters and different things like that. So you've got this nice move, pulls back, consolidates. You can see it's, it's pretty much holding trend all day. And then at, at 3 p.m., it starts its nice little grind in the close, and you want to focus on dips. You don't want to just be buying every breakout and chasing because that's what a lot of people do. You want to get the better price. Sometimes you might miss it, but you know what? That's okay too. So after 3 p.m., or actually a little bit before 3 p.m., you can see it starts to grind up. So now you're interested on the dips. You've got a nice set risk first reward, 36 or so. This is the 36 was the prior top. Now it's probably going to end up being support. So buy a dip, buy a dip, buy a dip starts to grind up, and then the last couple of minutes, it kind of just goes up on air, and the volume is pretty consistent. If there was a ton and ton and ton of volume in the close, there's a good chance I'd probably take some off, just because I don't want to be in the same trade that everybody else is. So this has a history of gapping. If you look at the daily chart, you can see that normally when it closes at the highs, the next morning it opens up a little bit higher than where it closed at. 
So here's the two-day chart, and you can see you've got that nice move. Then it comes up into the close. Prior close is this line right here. And this is what a gap looks like. So 9.30 open is right about here. Pulls back a little bit and then just shoots straight up. So psychological target, once it opens out of the gate, starts to break 45, 46, 47, everybody's going to be thinking 50. But the problem is, is if it breaks 50 and it goes over and under, guess what? Everybody's hitting the bid. So why not take at least half off into the strength? No questions asked. Go ahead and hit lock in at least one half. So that's exactly what I did on this morning. I gave myself a little bit of room in case it went through 50, but I went ahead and locked in half. And then once it put in a few more tops at a lower high, I went ahead and got rid of the rest. And it ended up fading off. Like I said, a lot of people will turn a gap play into a hold because they wanted more. Or, you know, maybe they sold a little bit 44 and they really wanted 50. And then it looked like it was going to go to 50 and then it didn't. And then it looked like it was going to and then it didn't. And now they're set in their mind that, oh, we got, I got to get 50. I got to get out at 50. And then all of a sudden they hold it 44. 42, 40, and then they turn a nice good trade into a loser when the entire time the game plan was gapper. Buy before close, sell into the first five or ten minutes. When you have a gap play, when that's your plan, treat it as such. Once again, just to put a little bit of lines on the chart just so you can see it, you can see where that short term top was intraday the day before. You can see it grinding into the close, higher lows, set risk. And then here's the entire gap in the morning emotion, the squeeze, uh, and all that good stuff that you can take advantage of and go ahead and take profits into. Next up, PHOT. Now this is when marijuana was hot. This was when CVIS, PHOT, MJNA, and all these other crazy stocks just started taking off because they thought they were going to legalize marijuana or they did legalize marijuana in certain places and it was just a really hot topic for quite some time and all these companies were able to benefit even though they don't really have too much going on. So PHOT obviously has a nice little trend you can see throughout the day, it's trading quite a bit. But what you want to focus on is after 2 and mainly 3 to 3.30 plus and you want to look at dips as long as the trend holds. And you can see the trend holds, very bullish, and then it starts to float up into the close. So that's exactly what happened here, nice strong close. Next morning, gaps up 11, runs to 12. So you want to go ahead and take advantage of the morning emotion, morning momentum, follow through, anticipating that gap, go ahead and take your profits and move on. Same thing, CVIS, got that nice morning move, consolidates through the day at 3 p.m. It starts to grind back. You watch all dips into the close, and as long as trend holds, and you can see a nice little line right under that, as long as trend holds, Got a nice little gap up and a big rip. So that's the OTC gap up plays, anticipating the gap up plays and how to really anticipate it and what stocks that I'm actually interested in. And what you have to think about is what's really going on. And a lot of these OTCs aren't really reacting to just news itself, but it's actually reacting to newsletters, mailers, and things like that which have a positive influence on the stock price. So take it a step further and when do these things hit? When do the newsletters hit? Each night, each morning. So if you're overnight and everybody comes out with a newsletter again and says, oh, we told you so, this stock's going to the moon, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's going to be excited and happy and they're not going to be sellers. So then you've got that gap up follow through momentum, and that's exactly what we're looking to take advantage of, that morning momentum, the people that don't want to miss the move to a dollar, ten dollars, whatever, when it's at five cents or ten cents or a dollar. All those people that missed out on the day before, they said, ah, oh, man, I read the newsletter, I should have bought, then all of a sudden goes up the next day. Well, guess what? They don't want to miss it again. They don't want to miss the next 100% move or the next 50% move, whatever it might be. So that next morning, they've already got their orders in, they're ready to buy, and what happens is pre-market market makers can see those orders coming in. So if it's 10 cents by 11 cents and everybody has their orders in at 11 cents or 12 cents because they want to get in, well, why are they going to sell at 11 cents when the limits are 12 cents? Why not just go ahead and move up the offers? 
and see how high people are willing to pay and how high people are willing to chase. And that is the move that we're taking advantage of here. So next up is gearing and perking. Risk versus reward. How to anticipate it, how to determine it, and the same type of setups that we look for on NASDAQ. Same exact stuff. It's just different price ranges. We're not looking at a $12 stock, a $6 stock. We're looking at $0.02, cents, $0.10, cents, $0.50. Cents. So same idea here. You can see that there's this accumulation through the day. That Most of the hits are on the offer, just kind of hitting two cents, two cents, one hits the bid, two cents, two cents, two cents, two cents, two cents. And at some point, when that two cents breaks, it's probably going to break out. And it's all about the risk first reward. In a stock like this one where it's been hovering at two cents for quite some time with a base at 0.018, it's a good risk first reward when this two breaks that you can go in any size and pretty much risk towards 0 0.018, 0 0.017, whatever. Whatever you're comfortable with, risking towards the lower days because that's been the base for quite some time. So now you start to see the volume start to come in and then bigger volume, bigger volume. Then the 0.02s finally break and it starts to lift. So we went ahead and anticipated this break just because we were comfortable with the risk first reward. It was slowly inching up and I know it's hard to see, but these tops become a little bit higher here and then a little bit higher here. And this is actually when we anticipated it, when it started to break that 0.02. And then it had a nice little breakout. You can see here it started to lift gearing right off the lows there. And that's when we were getting long. And it ended up trading throughout the entire day, holding those trends, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. And then finally the momentum shift and you can see double top, lower high, lower high, and so on and so forth. Next, HIDC. Now, you've got this big morning move. This was an awesome penny stocks, which I'll cover in a little bit. This was a pumper play, a, a newsletter that came out. And it had a ton of volume pre-market. Then it came down at the open and started to just go nuts out of the gate from basically 0.015 to 0.045. Then it pulled back, pulled back, and started to consolidate. But what are you looking for? You're looking for that gearing and perking to be able to give yourself a set risk versus reward. Give yourself a risk that you're okay with versus a reward that's better than the risk. So let's take a look. See that same top? 0.036, and then it starts to gear. Low, a higher low, higher low, higher low. It's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Same stuff that we look for on NASDAQ. I'm going to show you another chart. This one shows it through the day and what actually ends up happening. And you can see how it starts to hold the trend throughout the entire day. And once it breaks through that 0.036, it actually becomes support for the rest of the day. And your risk is based off this 0.032s, 0.033s whatever this double bottom is here. So hopefully by now you're starting to see what I'm looking for. And if you miss that entire move, what you need to see in order to have a good risk versus reward setup in the future. Since OTCs are a little bit more controlled, it's not really all the NASDAQ firms and things like that that are trading them, but rather maybe just one or two big people behind it keeping trend. A market maker, a couple of market makers that know what traders need to see and as long as they paint that picture for the traders, it's going to keep traders interested. And that's exactly what you're seeing here is you see the consolidation. You're working out any of those people that bought major size from the lows. Let's just say you bought 500K shares here or a million and it goes straight up and you're like, oh, great, I'm up huge, but I'm going to sell 500. Oh, no, nope, can't fill. Then they kind of shake you out, shake you out, shake you out. And as it gets tighter and tighter, you're thinking, oh crap, what if it goes to two cents? And when you have a million shares or 500,000 shares, it's kind of scary. But if you have 50 or 100,000 shares or 25,000 shares, it's not as scary. And that's what they want to do. They want to break you down from having a ton of shares to having a small amount of shares because that's going to be less resistance for them in the future. Same idea here. You've got the morning move. And this is actually in play the day before. That's why we're interested. It had a big move from sub penny to like six cents, then pull back, consolidated through the day. And then this morning, it had opened up higher, and then washed out, put in a top, a top, a top, faded a little bit, top, top, top. And you can see it starts to grind a little bit higher and higher. And as soon as it breaks that top, 
you know you can go long with a risk base right here. So that's exactly what I did and it went off crazy. And typically I would go ahead and sell into a big move like this or a big move like this, but we were in a market where these things were going to like 20 and 30 cents. So I said, you know what, I have small shares. I might as well go ahead and just let it ride. So I did. And, you know, I let it ride all the way back down to 9 cents and then back up to 10. And, you know, it almost actually did go uh, back through the high of days. But uh, I went ahead and cut it off here just because I had dipped down to 9 cents. And then, you know, it started to go back up. So I was happy. And uh, I decided I wasn't going to be greedy and went ahead and took it off. But the point here is same idea. You've got that intraday top. And as it comes closer and closer and closer, higher support, higher support, higher support. And as soon as it breaks... You want to go long. Next, I'm going to talk about different websites like Awesome Penny Stocks, Victory Mark, that are actually pumpers. They're promoters, and if you actually read the fine print, even if they lie, they get paid 5000 500000 a million, whatever it may be, to tell you that this stock is going to the moon. It's a very gray area, but you need to focus on the ones that actually have an impact on the market. There's a ton out there. There's people that get $500, $1,000, and things like that, but they're not going to have a major impact on the market. What you care about is which ones bring you a trading opportunity that you can take advantage of. And Awesome Penny Stocks and Victory Mark, I would argue, pretty much own the OTC market at the current time. And by that, I mean when they alert a stock, it trades tens of hundreds of millions of shares like immediately, within the first day. And that's what matters because it gives you a trading opportunity. Whether it's long or short, it doesn't really matter, but they did have a great track record. But every now and then, they throw in a little sour one into the mix and then they end up just raising money, basically. I call it like a money raise play. They might support a stock for two weeks, four weeks, a couple months, whatever it may be, and then they get their money back on the next one and pretend it never happened, and then they give you another great one and you're supposed to forget about the bad one. Then there's also bright markets. Bright markets is something that sort of just snuck in there recently, and uh, you know they've been creating a quote-unquote name for themselves, and uh, you know it's a great run-up, a great first move, but what you need to know, and, and half of understanding pumpers is actually understanding you know what they tend to do and what you can learn from their past ones. So bright markets, you might buy on the way up, and make a good trade, but I know that on that day that they pull the plug when it starts to tank, I know from experience that I do not want to be buying the first dip, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. And then there's derated pumpers. Now, like I said before, you want to concentrate on the ones that actually move the market, that actually have an impact on traders and volume and all that good stuff. So the other thing that you can do is watch these derated pumpers, see if they fail, see how it reacts, and you can actually get short because Number one, you know that there's a third party paying for them. The third party probably wants to sell. So if it goes up a little bit and it can't hold trend, you know that A, somebody just sold, B, they probably want to sell some more, and C, if you start to freak out all those people that just bought, they're going to come back and hit the bids and it's going to end up dropping. So this is what you need to ask yourself. Are they actively marketing? And what this means is when you Google hot stocks, hot penny stocks, stocks to buy, 2013 penny stocks, uh, top stocks, whatever, you would search to find a hot stock if you didn't really know what you were doing, they target that. So that's what I tell people is to kind of think about if you were marketing, what type of people would you want to attract? What keywords would you want to attract? And type those in and then look at the banners and see who's advertising. See who's advertising the most. And usually those ones have the most pull because they're actually bringing in new people, new people, new people. And it's a continual refreshment of new buyers and new people that just want to get rich. And they see this ticker and then they end up buying. They don't really know anything about it. And then we all come in the same way and we all buy these thinking that they're going to the moon. It's only at five cents. And we end up losing our shirt once or twice. So again, the ones that are most actively marketing are the ones that are going to have the continuous flow, the new people that are coming in, the good volume. The next thing you need to ask yourself is how did their last promotion do? How did the last promotion perform? And this is important because if the last one went down 90%, do you think everybody's going to be all excited besides the new people that they just got on their list the past maybe week and a half of marketing? 
Do you think that the old people on the list are going to be excited about the last one that was a 90% drop? Chances are they're going to take a step back and they're probably not going to buy. So how often do they have picks? Is it once a month? Is it once a quarter? Is it every week? There's different promoters. Different promoters might take less and do two or three pumps per week. Other ones might care more about their brand, for lack of a better word, and only do one per month in every two months. And then there's a couple like SMA or um, I think it's Eric Dickinson or something like that, but they only do one or two, maybe three per year, but they're big and they focus on actually creating a big one, a good one, not necessarily a good company, not necessarily good long term, but a stock that moves from maybe 50 cents to $3 or a dollar to $5, things like that. And it's a massive campaign. It's on a much larger scale. The other thing that you need to consider is to always stay grounded. And that's a mistake that I've made. And a lot of times, you know, I go bigger and bigger and bigger as I make more and more and more. But if you just stay the same, that time that you end up hitting a wall and it's a bad pick, you're only going to give back one time. So if you just made a bunch of money three times in a row and all of a sudden they give a, a lemon, a, a sour one, and it goes straight down, well, if you're slowly playing bigger, 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 three times your size, well, you're going to give back those three times. But if you focus and you just do the same thing each time without getting greedy, you're only going to give back one. And lastly, what you need to be aware of is one thing that they do is they take advantage and they know what people are thinking. If they're hot, 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 they're gonna throw one in the mix there when they're the hottest. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, the last one went 20 cents to $2. I am going all in on this one. And then they just spend all day just selling. And maybe they can make 10, 20 million dollars in a couple hours because the last one went 20 cents to $2. And that's what you need to be aware of because if you do buy into that and it doesn't start to break out and it looks like it's kind of top heavy, it looks like it's going to probably pull back, well, you need to get out because they do throw those in there and then everybody loses. And then the next one, guess what? It's going to be the best one. And everybody's going to forget that one that just dropped 90% and everybody lost their shirt on. Everybody's going to wish that they you know, nailed this other one, but they're always one step ahead of the trader and that's what you need to be aware of. Now, APS and Victory Mart, these ones, like I said, was a little bit of the sister site. They worked together. They used to go out on the same stocks together. And then they sort of split off. They used one, and everybody anticipated the other one to come out, and then they didn't. And it's kind of, once again, taking advantage of the trade. If they get you in the mindset that every time APS goes out with a play, Victory Mark is going to follow, or vice versa, every time Victory Mark goes out on a play, APS is going to follow, then they start to be able to use the list without really using them. Because if people can connect the dots and Victory Mart puts out a play and then APS says, hey, we have a play coming, well, they don't ever even need to release a symbol, but they're still going to get those people that can connect the dots, the big traders, the people that are familiar with these things to buy the Victory Mart play. And that's how sneaky they are. And uh, it's just something to consider. But for quite a long time, they were unstoppable. I mean, every single time they had a massive pick and it just 20 cents to a dollar, 20 cents to two dollars, 50 cents to two dollars, and everything just went right up. You could trade any size, $100,000, $250,000 worth of position, sell it out in a couple minutes, no problem. These things would trade millions, 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 20 million, 30 million, 50 million in, in one day. First day, all they got to do is release the ticker and boom, it's off. And I would always sell too early. Then a lot of times what I was saying is they split the list. They take advantage of the users. Instead of all going out together, they start to split the list. They'd go three sites one day, three sites another day, three sites another day. And keep in mind, Austin Penny Stocks had maybe 5, 10, 15 sites. Victory Mark had about 10 or 15 sites. So what they would do is they'd start to split it. So then they'd go to maybe two sites on day one, then three sites on day two, then five sites on day three. And then they do the entire list on day four or five or wh whatever it was. So what they started to do is make believers and make people understand that, hey, they always are going to back it with each of those lists. They're going to split those 25, 30 lists total over a week period. So now all they had to do is release it to one list on day one and everybody assumed that they're going to go to every single list. And what they do is they throw in one of those sucker plays and they just money raise off of one list. 
So they don't ruin the rest of their list. They only screw the front loaders or the people that are familiar with how these things work and their whole sheep, if you will, the people that are actually searching it on the other list that don't really know how to tie the knots together are fine. So that's just what you have to understand. Times are always changing and uh, you have to be open to it. You can't ever believe or trust a promoter because at the end of the day, they're there to sell stock and that's that. The company doesn't matter. There's been quite a few plays. This is just some of the very good successes. Uh, you can pull these charts up, POTG, NSRS, AMWI. These five were very big ones. Uh, these were back to back to back. And then they ended up throwing in RARS, and then they did a few more, and then they threw in the VLNX, and then they did PWEI, and then they threw in ESSI, which was actually PRTN. And after these liquidation plays, they would come back with some cheap play, like at five cents, and they'd run it to 25 cents or 40 cents or whatever it may be. And then everybody was like, oh my, they're back. And they forget about all these ones that went literally from 30 cents to sub penny within a week. So just to give you an idea of some of them on the charts, and again, you can go back and search these tickers right here and you can see exactly what they did, but you can see how they kind of grind up. This is below 20 cents. This line right here is 20 cents. So came out this day, it traded 60 million shares, and it just sort of floated around with a 20 top. They were shaking out people. And then all of a sudden it just took off. And I, I think they had mailers going out and a bunch of other things, but you know it went off. Next day it pulled back, closed back up, and then it took off to $1.40. And then obviously it tanked straight down and actually went to about 25 cents, 30 cents that day before rebounding to 40 or 50 cents. Rebound in the next couple days and then back under a dime, which was just incredible. Um, just to, to really understand that this was just $1.40 and then all of a sudden it's under 10 cents. When you think about it, you get an idea of you know what's going on here. And another one, NSRS. This was a really nice one. This came out day one. Uh, it was about 15 cents, ran to 20 cents, and then they slowly floated up, floated up, floated up towards 60, consolidated around 60 to 80, and it almost hit a buck 80. And you can see exactly how fast it pulls in major, major volume this day, 120 million shares. And some of the liquidation plays that I was talking about would look like this. It would have candles like this. So let's just say, hypothetically, this is 20 cents on day one, and then just boom, straight down to 5 cents, then the next day straight down to 2 cents. And that's what they would throw in in the middle, and that's what you have to watch out for. If the trend doesn't hold, it's not worth playing size. And in this day and age, it's just not worth it uh, to play the size that you used to be able to because they're just taking money out of the markets, and they don't care about you. Next up is Brighton Markets. Now, Brighton Markets has a bunch of different websites, and you can search those on Google, but... The main thing is how did their last pick do? And these guys have actually had a pretty decent track record, but the problem is after that first dip, it just absolutely goes straight down. And that's what you need to be aware of. And uh, a couple examples is IDNG, PUNL, GNIN, and TALK. Now, if you want to take a look at the charts, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So you've got this nice move from about 70 cents, and it slowly goes up to 170. But... When it starts to pull, you can see that day absolutely straight down to 40 cents, under 40 cents. Then the next day, almost down to about 30 cents or, or lower, about 25 cents, and rebounds back up to 35. But they don't have very big bounces. A couple days later, about a week later, straight down under a dime. So this is what you need to be aware of. On the way up, it's strong and it's got great volume. And it's very nice to trade. But as soon as it looks like it's either flatlining or starting to pull back or anything like that, and it's been up for a week or two, get out, stop playing the overnight gap, stop buying dips, and be aware that these people do not support dips after it pulls back. You can see the same thing here. Once again, it's just a fantastic move, but as it goes, grinding, 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 and you can see it dipped this day, but they saved it. Same thing. And these are like the tells. Like at this point, you should start trading a lot smaller. You should not be believing in it, and you need to be careful. And again, not that you'd be holding this entire time, but the most important thing to take away from this is just because it's dipping and it's down, you know, from 90 cents to 40 cents, it doesn't make it a buy. 
these things rarely hold the rebounds and you really need to be patient and wait for a big washout. And that's exactly what happened here. It went from just about a dollar to under a dime in five days. Take one more look, GNIN, same idea. Great trade, it starts to go, 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 go. Major volume, you can see, I mean, it's four, three, four, four, 10 million shares, 15 million shares, and it goes up to 350, but as soon as it comes down, they're not supporting, and it went down, it went from 350 to 35 cents in three days. And last but not least, talk. This was another recent one, and keep in mind, a lot of times it's had their last due. So this was a, a coming off of GNIN, and you know they're telling everybody, oh, our last pick went from 50 cents to 350. You know you want to be in early. Well, here it is, and you can see the major volume, eight million shares up here. And so once it starts to go towards that psychological target of two, you know everybody starts to think that gaps up goes, gaps up goes, gaps up goes. And then it's over to, kind of pulls back behind it. Next day it goes and kind of tops out again, has lower high, lower high, lower high. Then it snaps that two and it does not come back. And this thing went straight down to about 68, if I remember correctly. Uh, it did end up rebounding quite nicely. And uh, I think the key here was because the last one had a nice rebound, ended up coming back to $2. So I think people had that in the back of their mind. Okay, how did the last one do? All right, well, it rebounded off the lows pretty nicely, but it you have to wait for it to bottom. And that's exactly what happened here. You know, it went way down and then it, it came back nicely, but uh, it wasn't anything like the prior ones. And the key again is once it turns, once it once it starts to snap, do not just trade a normal rebound. When it looks like it's about to rebound, think about it because these things do not bounce when you think they are going to. Now, obviously, you can short these OTC stocks as well. Uh, it's much like NASDAQ stocks. You watch for the overextended charts and the momentum to start to shift. And once it does shift and you start to have lower highs and lower highs and lower lows, you want to watch all the pops for a short so that your risk is limited to the prior resistance point. And OTCs are more likely to get bought in faster, meaning you typically have T plus three. If you short something, you should always assume that you're going to get bought in within three days because a lot of times you're borrowing it from somebody who's long and most people don't really hold these things for very long. So if they sell, you're going to get that call in and you're going to have to cover your short. So you need to know your newsletters. Like I've been saying, the D-rated ones are the ones that, in the case that I'm going to go over next, are sort of like the one and dones. And you know, you've got those morning idiotic people that think that these things are all going to go to the moon. And, and the problem is, for example, with Sock Psycho, uh, which is a, a newsletter, he does these sub uh, penny ones that are like 0 .001 with no float, and all it takes is maybe 100,000 shares, and they're at two cents, and then they run to five, six, seven cents. And then you can tell everybody that they ran 8,000% or 15,000%, and everybody thinks, oh man, if I just put in 1,000, I'd have 15,000 or 150,000 or whatever. And they start doing all these crazy numbers in their heads. So what they do is they go nuts on the next one, and then they go nuts on the next one. And it just creates this emotional spike in the morning, which you, as a educated trader, can take advantage of. And you can see exactly that. This is a stock psycho type play. Uh, and we ended up shorting into this pop. And it was just taking advantage of that morning emotion. It's, it's a low float stock, something that doesn't have a lot of shares out there. But you can see that it went from $0.04 cents to $0.20 cents on basically a million shares. So shorted a little bit. And uh, once it hit like a little bit of wall and had a lot of volume at the top, then it came straight back down. 
Same idea here, AXXU. This was a compensated play. They're not always compensated. A lot of times they do low floats to build their list to be able to say, hey, we had 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 um, percent. But this is another example of getting actually paid for it. So, you know, he was coming off a hot win. Stock went from 110 to 170, I mean, in one candle. So it also has history. It had been trading for months and months. It had other programs on it and things like that. So there's going to be a lot of stock holders. So I went ahead and got short into the pop, and uh, it ended up coming right back down and consolidating. EMBS is another example. I covered way too early, but you know it went from five cents to thirty cents. And again, I wait for it to hit a wall and then retest and has a lower high. Then I want to get short. And this one went from $0.30 cents to 15 I covered, uh, and then it ended up fading all the way off and, and consolidated throughout the day. Next up for OTCs, what I'm interested in is the panic morning washout. And it's much like the NASDAQs where they've had a week close, they gap down, they wash out, and you buy the dip. That's pretty much the same exact thing, but the key is that not every OTC I'm interested in. They've got to have a big promotion. They've got to have high money volume. I don't care about the stuff that's traded a couple hundred thousand dollars and then it drops 50 or 70 percent and you know maybe it bounces a little bit. What I care about is when there's millions and millions of shares traded, there's millions and millions of dollars that's exchanged hands and there's thousands and thousands of trades that have gone back and forth because the more trades, the more volume and the more money volume there is, the further spread out the shares are going to be. It's not just going to be a handful of traders that are making the trade. There's going to be thousands of traders making the same trade. So what I like to do is be able to be one step ahead of all those thousands of traders that might potentially buy the bounce or average down. And when you focus on something, when there's that many people, there's always going to be an audience. And like I said before, it's important to have that audience. So what you want is a weak close, something that's been trading for a long time and then it finally just cracks. And then it's fade, 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 fade all the way into the close, some type of gap down and then panic at the open. And then once there's that panic and once you start to see the market sales coming out and everybody kind of freaking out, you want to size in and you have to understand that your risk may be 30 or 50%, but the reward is you can easily double. And that's a hard concept for a lot of people to get. So when you're buying in, you have to sort of consider that. Okay, well, if I'm buying in with 5,000, my risk might be two grand, but if I'm right, I'm making a five grand. And, you know, do that with a thousand dollars. Your risk might be four or five hundred. You might make a thousand, two thousand. Whatever it may be. But understand that the reward is bigger, so the risk is going to be a little bit bigger. And you want to either nail it or you don't. Once it starts to turn and starts to go, you don't want to be a buyer. You only want to buy it into the panic. Here you can see this stock. This one has gone from pretty much two cents to 20 cents. And it's been on about five to 10, if not more, million shares per day. Then it started to crack. You can see where it starts to fade off, 16 to 14 to 12 to 10. Now we're getting interested because this is starting to wash out. And each morning we're gonna be interested as long as there's a gap down and then potential rebound. And you can see exactly how it rebounded off the lows here. And if you look at it intraday here, you can see I had a nice little breakout here, and then washes out, rebounds a little bit, consolidate, 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 and then it breaks that prior base right here, and it snaps midday. No real news, just general trading and profit taking. So then the next day, it opens up, kind of just hangs out, and then it starts to have a very weak close, and it skips down from eight to seven. And then the next morning, it gaps down, washes out, a ton of volume, and then it rebounds and it literally almost doubles off the lows. If we take a look at that closer, you can see it pretty much faded the last half an hour, the last 15 minutes into close. So you've got this emotional panic going into the close from nine cents to eight cents to seven cents. And then you can see this gap down that happens the next morning, almost a penny, and it washes out. And then when it starts to wash out and you start to see where the bid, which if you remember is the left side of level two, if the bid doesn't move and all the offers are stacking up, but the volume starts to get heavy, 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 and they're buying everything on the bid side, that's when I'm going to be interested in it. And I know that it's not going to make sense, but it's something that you need to be able to pull up 
the level two over time. And as you watch it, as you watch different tanks, and as you watch different plays unfold, it'll start to make more and more sense. But the point is, is right here you might maybe have a risk on five cents, four cents, something like that. And then, as you can see, just rips right back up to eight cents. Pulls back a little bit, holds trend. You can see actually another ABCD type pattern where it goes up, pulls back, starts to grind. You can anticipate that long for the nine test. But this is a panic morning washout. Here's another one fork. This thing I traded a ton under a penny. Started to consolidate, went up two cents, and then ended up breaking that prior resistance here at five. Went up, 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 all the way to 25. And it's not as high volume as the other ones, but it's been trading. It has a big trend. There's more than just a handful of traders in the stock. And this is actually a stock with a big history. It goes all the way back, and it actually had a very big move back in the day. So there's tons and tons of shareholders. So this thing went all the way up to 25 cents. It all of a sudden just cracks. No news, just cracks on major volume. So now we're interested. Not necessarily going to play it into the close, but what I want the next day is a gap down, a washout, and there's probably a real good chance that it's going to rebound. And that's what we got here. You can see that it was basing at that 20 level. Once it gave up that 20, it just faded all day, all the way into the close down to 7 cents. That next morning, it gapped down from 7 cents to about 5, washed out a little bit, and then literally tripled off the lows. Just because everybody's kind of selling it out the day before, Everybody panics here, and once everybody panics out, there's no sellers left. There's only balanced players, average down type people, and as soon as it starts to go, everybody pulls their sells, they wait for it, and it just absolutely rips. And even if you didn't get the 15 cents, which there's a good chance you wouldn't have, you still got a nice little double all day. Next is the bounce play, and this is more on promotional side, and it has to do with the intraday washouts and how you can take advantage of them. If it's a slow and steady grind down, you don't want to buy it because you never know where that's going to end. It could slowly and steadily drop throughout the day from bell to bell. The edge that you're going to have is in the panic, and it's not for new traders. You have to watch for the blocks, just like I said before on the panic washout, and the bids remain steady. So the key is a stock that's been in play, a stock that's been promoted, and it keeps on hitting a, a ceiling for the day. And as soon as it hits that ceiling and keeps on retesting an intraday support level, when it cracks and everybody keep on hitting the bids and just go nuts, market, panic, that's your edge. So you're going to watch for it to fade, 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 slow, steady grind, and all of a sudden the bid just drops out, the level two starts to spread a little bit, and then you can take advantage of some of the panic. So let's take a look here. You've got this HIDC, this is the second day after the promotion has started, and late day, Cracks. Not really interested. It only went from four cents to 0.035. Not a big dip. Retest, support here. Retest, support. Now, free fall mode. Straight down, grind, grind, grind. And you can see right here where it starts to panic out. And it actually went from two cents to 0.015 in one bar versus all these other ones that were going down slowly, 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 slowly. It starts to grind down and then the panic comes in. This is something where Again, you go back on the other side of the trade and you say, all right, where is everybody panicking? Where would I panic? Where would I be hitting the sell button if I were new, if I were unfamiliar with this stuff? And the problem is, is a lot of people will try to sell here and it won't fill because everybody's trying to do the same thing at once. And then the people that don't use limit orders that we went over before and why it's important to use limit orders versus market orders, the people that use market orders are still not filled and now it's just is any price, any price, any price, you know, get me out, get me out, get me out. So now it's finally starting to find a little bit of support and it might start to find a little bit of buyers and guess what's going to fill? All those market sells at the bottom. And that's what we're looking to take advantage of. And you can see here, this isn't always the case, but it ramped all the way back up almost red to green. So this happened after BOPT halted intraday and everybody started to panic like, oh no, maybe the next promo to pretty much halt intraday is HIDC. So there was a ton of panic and you can see how it sped up right here and then they just shot it right back red to green. And uh, it worked out really well the next morning. You can see this is the next morning. Uh, it had a nice little base at four and then they ripped it up to five cents. So overall it was a really, uh, really neat trade. 
again, taking advantage of that panic. And you can see four cents to almost a penny within an hour. Another one you can see here is XUII. This is actually by the same people. Now this is on the way up still. It, it was it was on the, the first trend up from 15 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents. And you can see it kind of gapped up, pulled back a little bit, retested, started to fade. So now the panic is in, the reason to sell is in. This is the first time that it's really pulled back much. So it came back, went red, and it helped. Then it went back up and it could not re-break the prior highs. It could not get back up there. So the panic started setting again. You can see this base here at 34. So now the key is if 34 breaks, panic is probably going to set in because everybody's getting comfortable knowing that 34 they're buying it up and they're supporting it. And when I say there, I mean the promoters, whomever is behind a certain deal. So 34 snaps and then the panic sets in. You can see right here where 34, 32, 30, 28, and then all of a sudden just panic, 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 wash out, pay attention to the volume, and then we get the rebound. So we actually nailed this in chat. But once again, this is the type of action that we're looking for. I'm not interested in trying to buy right here on a dip. I'm not interested in trying to buy right here. I'm interested in range. When a stock is usually trading two, three, maybe four cents a day, and all of a sudden it drops eight cents or 10 cents in 15 minutes, that's what I'm interested in. That's where the bounce players are gonna be. That's where all the people are panicking. That's where all the people are going to average down because now they've got a 38 average and it's at 24 and the only way they're going to get even is if they bring their average to maybe a 30 or 32 average, things like that. Just to put some color on the chart here, you can see the line that I was talking about, the 34, where the panic starts and then again, the volume to pay attention to. And usually the bottom is met with a big volume bar because that's where everybody starts to panic out, that's where all the market sells order and that's where that bid is that whomever may be supporting or people like us who are playing the bounces will absorb all those cells that come down and then guess what there's nobody left and it bounces up on air and you can see that it went from 23 to 26 in a minute and then it continued to go on from there. Now that we've gone over everything in chapter 8, you understand the importance of lining up the charts on 3 months, the 6 months and intraday and how much more powerful with a bigger audience that breakout can be. Now you know how to anticipate gappers. You're looking for that slow grind and a close in buying pullbacks. You're not looking to buy the breakout. If there ends up being a ton of buying and just too much momentum into the close, it's okay to sell some. And most of the time, I like to sell the more momentum there is because everybody is on the same page as you at that point. And when everybody is on the same page, it's a crowded trade and I don't want to be in it. As you saw, the ABCD setup works for OTCs too. Not only for them, but better. As we went over, you've got Brighton Markets, Awesome Penny Stocks, and many other websites that are always pumping. They're always going hot or cold. But there's one way to monitor them, there's one way to be able to take advantage of them. And that's up to you, whether you want to spend the time sifting through them, managing what they've done and how their last was, and be able to make a good decision from there. And last but not least, for those that are able to withstand the risk, the panic bounce is one of my most favorite plays in OTC land. This is where some of the biggest money that I've ever seen in a day has been made with Fannie. FNMA and AAMRQ, American Airlines, some of the most incredible bounce plays come off serious, serious panic. It's not for new traders, but once you understand it, once you get a feel for it, sometimes it's just the most rewarding trade of them all.
Next stuff besides actually learning how to trade is actually having the right tools, and that's brokers. You've got to have the right broker. You can save yourself thousands and thousands of dollars. And if you're stuck under the pattern day trade rule, and for those of you guys who don't know about it, we'll talk about it, but if you're under $25,000, you can't make more than three round trips in a five-day rolling period. So what solutions do you have? We'll discuss those. I'll let you know exactly what you need for an account, how you can open one, where you should open one, and what kind of benefits you can get just by purchasing this DVD. A lot of people always focus on the commission. How much is it? How much can I save? What you need to remember is you get what you pay for. There was a company, and actually there is a company named Zecco, and it used to have free trades, and they used to make money on banner advertising and all kinds of stuff like that. And you really got exactly what you paid for. You paid nothing for the trades, and you really got nothing. There wasn't very good customer service. There wasn't very good fills. And all around, it was just an awful brokerage. And they've since partnered with Trade King or got bought out or something like that. Maybe they're a little bit better, but they don't have free trades anymore. So the point is, is you've got to get with a firm that is going to cater to you. And it depends on what type of trader you are. Do you need flat fee? Are you mostly OTCs and you want to be able to spend five bucks and be able to buy a million shares or something? Or are you a NASDAQ trader where you'd like to actually scale in and scale out and you don't have to worry about paying five dollars each time, but maybe a dollar or two dollars or something like that where you can freely scale in, scale out, and not have to worry about it. What I want you to keep in mind here is these are all companies that I personally use. I have personal relationships with all of these people, and I went to them and said, look, I'm going to include you in my DVD. What can you give my people for a deal, for a discount, or whatever, something that I can help benefit them to bring them a new client, but at the same time benefit you for buying the DVD and make them give you a special deal. So again, I use all of these and I've approached each and every one of these companies. So once again, every single thing that you're going to see here, I use, have used, do use, and 100% recommend and stand by. And if you have any questions before opening a broker, any questions at all, do not hesitate to reach out to me off the contact page. First and foremost, I'm going over CenterPoint. CenterPoint Securities has ETC and Wedbush clearing options. And what this means is you can open two different accounts there. One is going to clear through Wedbush, which has great borrows for most of the low floaters, NASDAQs that we trade. And ETC has just about the same amount of borrows, but they even have better borrows on OTCs. Now, personally, I do a lot of shorting. And their borrow list is second to none. There's over 10,000 shorts available, and it's not just NASDAQ, like I said. It's also a majority of OTCs and pinks. And there's borrows bell to bell. For example, if you have interactive brokers, you might open up the platform during the day, and you say, oh, great, it's easy to borrow. I can go and short this. But by the time you're ready to do the short, guess what? It's no longer available. With CenterPoint Securities, both clearing firms, if it's available at 8 a.m., if it's available at 9 a.m., it's going to be available at 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. So this is a benefit. Not only that, you also have desk-enabled options. So let's just say that ETC and Wedbush don't have the borrow that you're looking for, but Interactive Brokers does. Take a screenshot of that availability on Interactive Brokers, and you can send it in, and you can enable it, and you'll have T plus 3. The significance of T plus 3 is you can prepare, you can understand when you may get bought in. No matter what, you're going to be able to hold a stock for three days. You might be able to hold it longer, but the point is, is that you're going to at least have three days. So a lot of you might not understand how great this is right away, but as you start trading more and more and you're looking for better and better borrows because you realize that the TD Ameritrades and the E-Trades and the Schwabs and all those types of places don't have the borrows that you want. You keep on going and looking for a particular borrow this day and, ah, oh, crap, I wanted to short that, and guess what? Not available. Next day, oh, man, I can't do it today either. And that's the difference. The stocks that we trade many times are hard to borrow and that's why you need these good brokers. And one other thing I want to mention is with their ETC platform, they just added Dask Trader. And Dask Trader I'm going to get to in the next segment, but that's my most favorite trading software, and I finally got them to add it to ETC. So that's available as well as Sterling Trader Pro, which is another platform option that you have. So who do you need to know at CenterPoint Securities? Who do you need to contact, and what do you need to tell them? Number one, you're going to tell them that you got the DVD and you want the special. 
His name is Royce. He's a great guy. He's very helpful. And he's always there in the mornings anytime I need to find a locate or anything like that. You've got his email right here. And the special for all the guys that bought the DVD is you're getting a thousand dollars credit. You can trade free for the first month. You can apply it towards your data. You can do whatever you want as long as you put in 50 grand. Now, if you don't have 50 grand, that's okay. You're not going to get the thousand dollar credit. However, if you're from IU and you've got the DVD, the minimum is 30,000. But if you want all the goodies, it's a $50,000 minimum. And if you have any other questions, like I said, do not hesitate to ask me, but there's a little packet included with this DVD with the FAQ and the pricing and any questions that you have, Royce will be more than willing to help you. Next up is SpeedTrader. SpeedTrader is an Inc. 5000 company. It was number 703 in 2011. The company utilizes the Dash Trader Pro, which also includes the best mobile trading application out there. So any of you guys that have a smartphone, whether it's Android or iPhone, they've got a great level two charting, everything that you need at your fingertips for mobile. SpeedTrader is great for NASDAQ, and it's arguably the best OTC trading broker out there. Let's say, for example, you want to buy a million shares, and you're at center point, doesn't quite make sense. You're on a per share commission. So, if you're an OTC trader and you usually buy 500,000 shares, a million shares, 250,000 shares, whatever it may be, the benefit with Speed Trader is it's only going to cost you a couple bucks. Your point of contact is Craig. Craig's in the chat every single day. He's under Speed Trader Craig. You can receive the best deals through him. If you go direct, you're going to play nearly double. It's just like E Trade and Scott Trade and all the TV marketing gurus. If you go directly to the website, it's gonna have the price there, you're gonna sign up and you're just gonna pay. But if you talk to Craig, not only is he gonna cut the commission in half right away, he might even be able to do better depending on how much you trade. So here comes the PDT, the pattern day trade rule. If you don't have $25,000, this is you. As I said, you can only place three trades in a five day rolling period. If you place four or more, you're going to be considered a pattern day trader. So what this means is that you have to hold overnight if you do more than three trades in a five-day rolling period. Otherwise, you're going to be restricted. And if you're restricted, that means you can't trade. So if this is you and you don't have $25,000, you probably want to know what can you do? Where can you trade? What do you suggest? I've got the perfect firm for you. Just understand, the pattern day trade rule is there for a reason. It's to make you think for a minute before you make your investment decisions. So although there are options around it, if you do go around it and you do trade freely, just be careful. Do not overtrade. Focus on what you're doing and learn a strategy that works first. SureTrader. Now, SureTrader was founded by Guy Gentile. And if you remember, he created the Inc. 5000 company SpeedTrader that I just went over. SureTrader has been in business since 2008. It's been licensed by the Securities Commission of the Bahamas to carry out the business as a broker, dealer, and investment advisor. So your contact here is justin at suretrader.com, and once again, it utilizes Dash Trader. So you're going to say right away, whoa, wait a minute, Bahamas? What is that? So the point here is that you cannot day trade with under $25,000 in the U.S. However, the Securities Commission in the Bahamas does not have this. SureTrader cannot solicit U.S. traders. However, they can accept them. And what this allows you to do is to be able to trade under 25,000. We have a ton of traders there, they all love it, and the company's been getting better and better as it's been growing faster and faster. So once again, if you have any questions about any of these brokers, you can either contact them directly or reach out to me at any time right off my contact page. If you have a certain amount of money and you're wondering where to put what money where and how to split it up and all that kind of good stuff, feel free to drop me a line anytime and I'll tell you exactly what I would do if I was in your position. So this is DAS, otherwise known as DAS Trader. And this is the program that I use. This is the program that I love. It's not as pretty as some of the other ones that are out there are, but it's practical. And I don't really care what the picture looks like. I don't need high definition graphics and all kinds of crazy stuff. I need to know what is going on and I need to be able to see it clearly. And that's exactly what this program does. It's been around for quite a while. For those of you guys who don't know, I actually ring the NASDAQ bell with Karen Gentile, which is the founder of Dash Trader. I've worked with them a lot over the years, given them a ton of feedback. And I've had things added, such as the high day list 
and things that real traders need. And they're always listening to feedback, which is great because they're always adding on new things and making it better and better and better. So in a nutshell, you've got your level twos, you've got your time and sales, and you've got your charts. So this is how I have it set up. It comes different. But you can go ahead and, and pull up as many montages, which is the level twos. You can pull up as many charts as you want. You can do high-low ticker, which is this. It's probably the most important tool that you need to be a trader. On the left is all the lower days. Now, I will be honest. I hardly use the lower day list. Most of the time, I'm just looking at the high day list. And I'm looking for stocks that I'm familiar with, stocks that were on my scan last night, stocks that were on my scan last week, stocks that I've seen run before, former runners. And anything else that just keeps on lighting up on the right side here. It's a quick way to see exactly where the momentum is in the market. And this particular screenshot is from Dash Trader, which is the platform that I like. However, there's lots of different ones. E-Trade has one, Equity Feed has one, and there's just a bunch of other ones that you can set and actually scan different parameters and have different things show up and avoid seeing others. So this is just one of the many, but... At any point in time, you can see exactly what's hitting lower days and weak on the day and everything that's hitting high days and actually breaking out on the day. You've got the top list here, which I take a look at right in the morning to see, all right, what's up? What's, what's going on? What's up big on the day? What's down big on the day? And then I can kind of go over here and chart them and see if there's anything, you know, worth noting, worth playing in the morning and see... You know, what it looks like early at 8 a.m. versus 9 a.m. And then, again, it opens. So if it starts to have a good range, you know, for example, with SPWR now, I know that there's a possibility that if it pops out of the gate, I probably want to risk towards 2560s or a little bit higher just because it's been there already pre-market. So, again, this is how I have it set up. Now, I have the level 2 montage on the left right next to the time and sales. Now, time and sales aren't as important as they might be in OTC land. When you're trading the penny pumps, it's nice to see what the sizes are and, and all that stuff together, especially if you're playing bounce plays. But I've grown up with it, and I'm just used to it, so I go ahead and put it right there on the right so I can see everything. And then again, right on the right of that, I have the chart. Now, the shortcut to making these all connect so that when I type in Jazo, everything else moves, is this little anchor. So anything that you want to connect you just drag and drop the anchor to, and it's going to connect it. So let's just say, for example, I wanted a daily chart here, which you press that D, and I wanted to connect Jazo to it. Well, now you've got the daily chart right here connected because I dragged and dropped right over it. So now, if I wanted to go back and look at SPWR, it's going to pull up the daily chart for me in one click. Same thing if I want to see Google, Apple, Whatever it may be, you can pull it right up just by changing that one anchor. So now if I wanted to go back, I'm just going to go ahead and put this here to connect these three together. And that's how I do it. I connect it in a line, side by side by side. And for the daily charts, as you know, I look at the big charts, dot com charts, because that's just what I'm familiar with. So a couple little tidbits. XUII, just for an example, because it's in play right now. Right now, you're seeing four decimal points. That's a setting that I've put in. You can right click, go to level two config, and right here, it comes standard with three decimals. Now, if you leave it like that, you're not going to be able to see that the best bid and the best ask are actually going out maybe 0 0.3065, 0 0.3055. Now, let's take a look with the four decimals again. And you can see down here a little bit, 2595, 3582, you wouldn't have been able to see those. Now right now it's pre-market, so it's not as active, but this comes in handy if you wanted to play between the bid and the ask, and if you wanted to go 0.3111 or 0.3101, and you didn't realize that somebody's actually right there above you. So being able to see four decimals is very convenient, especially if you're playing OTCs. That's the first of many little changes that I make. The second is I go up to setup, and order templates. And this allows you to preset the number of shares that you want and the route. So for example, if on NASDAQ, I typically play 2,000 shares and I always want to route to ARCA. I can type that in and on all NASDAQ, it's now going to route to ARCA with 2,000 shares. So let's take a look. If I type in any NASDAQ, 
type in Apple. Now, obviously, 2,000 shares on Apple is not really legitimate, but any NASDAQ, I type in SPWR, JASO, it's going to autofill it with 2,000 shares in the ARCO route. Now, if you're trying to get into a stock real fast, this is very convenient because it takes away two steps from you. And then all you've got to do is put in the price. Now, you can either type in the price and type in 8.38, or you can go right here, click it, and it autofills whatever price you've hit. The other thing is, if you wanted 2500 you can click the size, and it autofills in the size. So that's just one little convenient thing that will take time away from the order entry and you missing trades. So next, setup, order templates. Now I'm going to go to NASDAQ, OTCVB as they call it, and pink sheets. So normally, I'm going to probably play 10,000, start, and I want to route tonight any time in force just for the day and apply. Quit, same thing, pink sheets. 10,000 shares, I want to route tonight, any, time and force, apply. So now when I go back to XUII, look at that, it's got 10,000 shares preset with night. Now I just have to press the price that I want. And if I leave the price alone and I press buy, it's going to put me on the bid. And if I put a sell in, it's going to put me in the offer. Now that feature is under setup and trading set. Default buy bid sell ask if the price box is empty. Now I like this feature because if a stock is tanking and I want to have the best bid at any given time, I can just leave the price box open and when I feel that it's about at the bottom, I can press buy and it's going to stick me right on the best bid. The next thing that I like to do is price does not change when route changes. This is not pre-clicked. Now what this is, is let's just say for example, you're firing away a couple different orders. So I send Knight to 32, I send VFIN to 32. Well, when you're changing that route, as you can see I am right now, you don't want the price to change. So let's just say you have 31.9 in there. CSTI, EVVV, Knight. You can see that 31.9 is staying the same. That is a convenient feature because if it changes, then you have to go back and you have to rewrite in the price, and then you have to press buy, and then you gotta go back here to check the next route, and then you gotta go back to the price, and it takes time. Trading is about cutting down on all these things that take time and just being able to get right to the market. Now, there's a couple other things. Default to position when the symbol is entered. So let's just say I had 50,000 XUII. So if I type in XUII, it would autofill my position. Now my positions would show right here, Symbol, account, shares, average cost, realized, unrealized, and this is where your orders are. But if I had 50,000 shares up here and I type this in, it's going to auto fill with it. And then if I sell 10,000 shares in the offer, it's going to automatically change it to 40,000. So it always resets to whatever your position is because it's thinking ahead. And it's highly likely that as a trader, you're going to want to sell that position out. So it's always putting whatever your current position is right there in the box for you. Now if you right click over time and sales, it's going to immediately pop up this time and sales configuration. Now you can change everything and do what you want with the colors and all that good stuff. But for me, I don't care about seeing the exchange and all that other stuff that it typically does. Sometimes if you see here, it'll show OTC, OTCQX, XXXI, and all, all different types of exchanges which don't mean anything to me. So all I focus on is price, quantity, and time. And then I unclick this filter here because I want to see the actual share size because a lot of times if you don't have this clicked, you're only going to see a 5 or a 79 or a 20. And then you have to re-remember, okay, well, 20 times 10, it's, a, it's on a scale of 10. And this just takes the guesswork out of it. You can see the exact share size that's coming through. And for me, especially on OTCs, when a stock's coming down or breaking out, I like to see the exact time of sales that are going through. So that's the only change that I have on time and sales. One thing here, you can see I have the symbol behind the chart. You can get that by right clicking the chart, going to configure, and then right here you can see the background name font. Click that and then you can change whatever size you want and whatever color, and it's going to display it behind. Then the next thing, which is a neat feature, if you double click it and you go to configure, you can show trades and show orders. 
This will allow you to not only go back and look at the trades that you make, but it's going to allow you to see what you could have done better. And it basically adds your entry and exits, as you can see here. It's got a little green arrow where I bought and a red arrow where I sold. Green, red, green, red. And then if the red's first, then that means it was a short, and then you bought back lower, and it's the green arrows. And this is awesome, especially if you want to go back and say, all right, well, I did this here, but I could have gotten out here. And it gives you a visual display of what all the numbers mean behind the scenes when you're looking at your order entries and time and all that kind of stuff. So it's a great way to go back and see what you could have done better. So that, in a nutshell, is the changes that I make to Dash Trader. This is by far my most favorite program, like I've said. I would always suggest having the market clock up because many times it's different than the clock that Microsoft syncs to. And this is actually tied right up to the NASDAQ servers, and it's the exact time that the market's going to open and close. Again, the top list shows you the gainers and losers. This is the high day list that we've gone over. This is something that I just absolutely love. Here you can see your realized, unrealized gains, your equity, your buying power, overnight buying power, tickets and shares. You can also change that to be able to see whatever you want to be able to see between your account, overnight buying power, liquidation share status, ECN fee, you name it, you can see it. Here you can change what you want to see. Again, uh, I just leave it usually as default, but you can see all the positions that you have. The symbol here in one account, just in case you had multiple accounts connected, the number of shares. So I'm going to put in some orders here. So 0 0.306, put in a bid, another bid, and I'll put in another one at 307. So now you've got your orders here, status is sending, this one's already accepted, and since it's pre-market, it's not immediate. You've got quantity and then the open. So let's just say I filled 5,000 shares. It would say 10,000 and then it would have open 5,000. It's got the time and then the day and the route that you're going to. If I ever wanted to cancel, you just have to hit X, or you can right click and cancel all and you can do it all at once. And then it's accepted, they're canceled, and they'll disappear. Guys, if you have any questions about setting up Dash Trader, you want to know the best thing to do given your computer, just email me. I'm more than willing to help. Next up is how to trade with me. You've got three options. Investors Live Scans, Investors Underground, and Investors Underground Elite. The first option is Investors Live Scans. This is a daily watch list. I do a scan each night, and it's pretty much a watch list of stocks that I'm planning on trading the next day, how I would trade them, what I would look for, and how I would execute the trade. You can expect to scan each night between 7 and 9 p.m. The price for this is $97 a month, and there's a major discount on annual. Next is the real deal. It includes investors live scans, so you get the scans each night, but it gives you access to the live chat room. Real-time alerts. I update a watch list by 9.15, so I take everything that's happening in the morning, and I put together a plan, my major three to four stocks that I really want to trade, and I have a plan to set forth what I'm going to do, how I'm going to react, and I share that with you. And then four webinars per month. Two by me and two by Michelle, which is another moderator in the chat room. And if that's not enough, you also get real-time assistance through private message, which you can pretty much IM us anytime or we're there by the computer all the time. And uh, the pricing here is $197 a month. And again, there's a major discount for annual subscribers. And last but not least is the best option, which is for those that really want to understand and really get a good grip on what's going on and see things visually each and every day. This includes Investors Live Scans, Investors Underground Live Chat and everything that I went over previously, plus it includes two to three weekly videos, and I must say, usually I do about five per week. It's a daily recap of the trades that I took, what I saw, how I anticipated it, taking a look at the daily chart, where my risk was, and how I executed the trade to either make a profit or a loss, and what you can learn from. And this is meant for the guys that really want to excel in trading and really understand the ins and outs of exactly what I do trade. This also gives you access to the video lesson library, which includes every single video I've ever done. And the pricing for this is $2.97 monthly. And again, there's a major discount on annual.